Day and can take part in numerous social and recreational programs. Christopher Heights, just over the Connecticut line in Webster, is a housing alternative for seniors offering an abundance of amenities in a warm, dignified residential setting. And Christopher Heights No Worries Pricing offers programs of financial assistance to enable residents to remain in their apartments once personal savings are depleted. If this sounds good to you and an elderly member of your family, what are you waiting for? Call Laura Cressetti at 508-949-0400 or visit them online at ChristopherHeights.com. At Christopher Heights, you're more than a resident, you're family. Taking a look at our local forecast with meteorologist Bill Jackman. Today, sunny and breezy, high 67 to 72. Tonight, clear, lows 44 to 48. And tomorrow, sunny and warm, high 70 to 75. At Carkill Falls, it's 62 degrees. That's the 10 o'clock report brought to you by Christopher Heights Assisted Living Facility in Webster. I'm Cherie Monty with WINY News. WINY Community Radio. And we're back on the WYNY Talk Show, and we are pleased and we're grateful today to have uh, the, all the candidates for first select person in, in Plainfield here to discuss the issues facing that town. I would add, for the benefit of the listeners today, that we're also uh, streaming this on Facebook Live. So if you have that, you can tune in and match up some faces along with uh, the, the voices, but not mine because I'm not in the pictures. So we have uh, Ms. Vicki Meyer who is the endorsed Republican candidate. We have uh, Ms. Kathy Tendrich, who is the endorsed Democratic candidate. We have Dan Reel, who is a Libertarian, and Kevin Cunningham, who is a write-in candidate this fall. Let's get right into the next question. And uh, Ms. Meyer, again, you will be, you've been leading off all day. You're going to lead off now. Are we going to do rebuttals from the last question? Um, I suppose we, we could. Does everyone recall what that question involved? Uh, child daycare? Right. So we all prepared for that? We can do that. Yeah, let's do this. All right, yes. let's go for it. <clears throat> go. One minute. Thank you. Uh, one of the things I just wanted to say was that, you know, the cost of daycare and the expense of daycare is something that's not new. Uh, my kids are 25 and 27, and I can remember having to have that conversation with my husband about whether or not we could afford for me to work and pay for child care. So that, this is not a new question. It's sad that it's, it is that expensive, but it's not news. So whatever we can do to help that would be great. But, I mean, I faced that problem when my kids were little, and I know that my friends and my, my kids' friends are now facing the same thing. All right, Ms. Tendrich. I agree. I think when a family decides to have children, that needs to go into their, their budget. If they're working families, then they need to plan on having daycare. It's not the responsibility of all the people in the, in the town to play, pay for someone else's daycare. There is a state program that's available for families out there that need help paying their daycare. But again, I don't believe that should fall back on the town. All right, thank you. Mr. Real, one minute, please. I, I couldn't agree more. You know, I mean, you have kids, that's that's on you. But the one thing that I we we all, I don't I think we agree, we can't emphasize enough, is if you have kids, you don't need higher taxes. You don't need any additional expenses because you got plenty where that came from. All right, thank you. Mr. Cunningham, one minute. I'd, I'd say the same. I think it's definitely a needed item, um, and, and it needs to be affordable because <laughs> – you have people, I mean, I've, I've talked to some people who are saying that um, without the prices the way they were, they couldn't be able to afford what they have going right now, which is, isn't a lot. Getting to work, having someone take care of their, their, their child uh, for services, and uh, still being able to put food on the table or, or, or to pay for the heat. All those things are important, so we have to make it affordable for the taxpayers and hopefully for those people. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll move on now to the next question. Thank you. And... Uh, Ms. Meyer, you once again will, will lead off. State budgeting issues have prohibited the Northeastern Connecticut Council of Governments, otherwise known as NECOG, from adding the town of Plainfield to its public busing transportation schedule. Despite significant interest from Plainfield residents as well as much enthusiasm from the rest of Wyndham County to close the public transportation loop down to New London. Do you believe it is important to restore public bus routes in Plainfield? If so, how would we do this, and what is your vision for public transportation in Plainfield altogether? Two minutes, please. 
Thank you. Um, yes, I do think restoring the bus route in Plainfield is essential. We are a gap in a, in a service stream that um, is just really not acceptable. Transportation in northeastern Connecticut is horrific. If you don't have your own vehicle, forget it. And a lot of people either can't afford to it or to have their own vehicle or they don't drive anymore. So yes, I think we need to work with uh, NECOG to come up with a, a, a bus line and a fee schedule that's appropriate and affordable for our, our residents. You know, one of the other issues is because we don't, we are very spread out, where is the bus going to stop and how do I get to that bus stop? So there's a lot of things that have to be worked out with NECOG, but I think it's important that we have that bus line. We need our, our young people and our seniors to be able to get where they need to go safely and affordably. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Tendridge. I do agree that we do need the transportation in Plainfield. I think it's something that we need to explore and see if we can fit it into the budget. I think it's important for families. Not every family is a two-car vehicle, uh, has two vehicles in the family. So again, I think it would be a great way to get families, the second person maybe to work. Not only that, like Vicki had stated, our senior citizens, and just since I've been out door knocking, that is a concern of our senior citizens, needing a ride to go to the doctors or going to their appointments. But again, it cannot fall back on the town. So it needs to be able to sustain itself. We need to explore any kind of funding that we can get to um, prevent that to be, to fall on the, the backs of our town's people. But it is, in my opinion, I think it's very important and we do need it. All right, thank you, Mr. Real. Well, I mean, again, I, I, and I, I hope this recurring theme continues because it means we're finally meeting reality, but you know, we, we essentially got like a, a $5 million bomb that, you know, Hartford sent us. I mean, and, and, and those, those bombs as they were, they're going to get bigger as the years go on. Um, fortunately, with the lack of transportation, you've got outfits like Putnam Taxi that have stepped up. But as far as our seniors go, I agree with Kathy. We can't, you know, we can't put this on the town. But one thing I would say is we can, however you know, really start cutting government, offering seniors meaningful property tax relief that way. I think if we're going to do anything for our seniors, that's the first place we have to focus. That way they can afford transportation. All right. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. I think there's two issues here. The first one, there is a dial -a ride The dial -a ride is for seniors and handicapped. And the, the problem with the dial -a ride is the fact that it is something where if you sign up for it, you, by the way, you fill out a form two weeks ahead of time, you're, you, you have applied. But if you sign up for it and something else comes up as a priority ahead of that, you get bumped. So your, your planning is, is down the drain. But for the rest of the town, we still need the full busing route process because we need to progress as a town. These people need to get to jobs. They need to be able to, to commute back and forth. So it needs to be there, absolutely. Um, the state of Connecticut obviously was given the information. I, I, my opinion was um, we, we, we dropped the ball. We put an ad out there saying, hey, we're going to bring a new busing route in. They hadn't even started up the process yet by putting the papers in through the state. That was a year behind. Um, so after that, um, yeah, now we're, we're up, up against it with the state budget. So the state budget says we can't afford this next process. Um, I really think we should be able to find monies with, via grants, via our own funding, to uh, to come into the next century. We need to be able to help everybody in our town to be able to uh, get transportation. So it is a huge thing. That's it's very important. Um, it needs to be done. Period. Thank you, uh, Ms. Meyer. Anything to add for one minute? Yes, I do. I do th agree that we know, as I stated earlier, we really need a bus service. There is a van at the rec department senior center that is helpful to seniors. They have to make their appointments in advance and it's always busy. Um, dial a ride is an option. However, I mean, I've served many people in, in the social services agencies and I have watched them sit for hours and hours and hours waiting for their ride to come. And that's, I mean, that's almost a HIPAA violation that they have to sit in a social service agency for that long. Um, so I do think that we need to come up with a way that is affordable and um, safe for our residents to get where they need to go, be it work or pleasure, recreation. Thank you, Ms. Tendrich. Anything to add for one minute? The only thing I'd like to add is, again, if we 
if we have transportation, if we can provide it, it's going to put families to work, help them to get to their jobs. And how that's going to help our economy is they're going to bring that money back into our town, and that's going to help with the economy. So, again, it is very important that we offer that. All right. Thank you. Mr. Real. Yeah, New Britain, I mean, had, I, I think, what, what they call it, the uh, busway to nowhere. It was some 50 miles of busway that everyone everyone said the same things we're talking about right now. And it turned out people didn't actually use it nearly at the volume that was expected. So, A, it went nowhere, and B, we set a whole bunch of money on fire. So, I mean, other than that, you know, we, we really are in a situation where, you know, finances are that bad off where if somebody says the government ought to – you need to stop them right away, and you need to give them a serious head check. Um, otherwise, we have Uber, we have Putnam Taxi. The bottom line is just because government doesn't do something doesn't mean people aren't going to find a way around it. I mean, after all, there is life outside of government. All right. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. One minute, if you so choose. Okay. Um, kind of adding to what people have been saying so far, definitely the idea is you're looking to have people have access to work work is going to equal to your tax base to be increased because they're going to be bringing the tax base and on top of that they're going to stay in their homes or apartments which means that you're not going to be watching an empty building go up with a foreclosure sale sign on it so that adds more negative to the town if you do putting a little bit of money in for transportation it's going to turn itself back in tenfold and so yeah, we have NECOG that has uh, uh, options right now I'd like to be able to enhance that further a full-time bus route be fantastic thank you uh we'll move on to the next question uh ms meyer once again leading off and batting first here it is a near fatal dog mauling back in 2014 has led to significant conversation and criticism surrounding plainfield's animal control office and how it handles reports of vicious and nuisance dogs accusations of negligence have come up numerous times in court as the related cases just recently ended in judicial sentences. What are your feelings regarding Plainfield's Animal Control Office and how it has handled vicious and nuisance dogs in the community? Do you see Plainfield continuing with its own animal control department or consolidating with the Northeast, Northeastern Connecticut Council of Governments, otherwise known as NECOG, as many other towns have? Two minutes, please. Well, thank you. That's quite the uh, uh, question. Uh, the the uh, animal control department has been um, a hot topic in Plainfield for quite a while. As far as the dog mauling, that's a horrific incident, um, which we hope is never, ever um, seen again in Plainfield. I know that once the dogs were impounded, it was extremely expensive for the town to maintain those dogs in the in the pound until um, until they were either put well put down. As far as animal control officer remaining um, in the town budget, that would really be a financial uh, decision and also one of um, local, big local concern. Our animal control officer is very responsive to local um, situations. I mean, I've had to call her. I live out in the boonies, so I've had to call her several times. Um, she's very responsive and very polite, and she does a great job. If we can maintain our own animal control person um, at a cost that would be equal to what it would be to join NECOG, I think that's, that would be fine. If we can join NECOG and save a lot of money and still have the same uh, personal and professional response time, that would be something to look at. Thank you. Ms. Tendrich, two minutes, please. Again, I think that it was a horrible accident that happened, and I hope it never happens again. How can we prevent that? As a town, I'm not really sure how we can prevent that. Do I think it's important to have our own animal control? Yes, I do. And for part of the reason, like Vicki stated, having our own animal control person in our town, it makes the call time and the response time, it really cuts it down. So if you do have an animal who is vicious or a phone call, we don't want to have to wait an hour for NECOG to get here. We want to be able to respond to that right away. Again, we need to make sure that it fits in the budget and that we can maintain that in the budget. But again, I really think it's important for our town, being a small town, being rural, that we really need to have our own animal control. 
Thank you, Mr. Real. I I couldn't agree more. And, and as uh, you know, I one thing I should point out: Plainfield just doesn't have dogs. Like, uh, for example, our animal control officer a few years ago had to come out and um, recapture of all things a wild emu. Um, you know, for those who don't know what an emu is, big ostrich type creature. Um, you know, we also have horses get loose sometimes, but uh, we really do have to have, you know, uh, a mechanism that, you know, is, is not only cheap, but can respond locally. And and I, I think we're, uh, we're on balance, we're doing a pretty good job. But as far as, you know, uh, the accident that happened, I mean, it's, it's terrible. Well, one way I would probably address something like that is, I mean, maybe there's something that can be done by way of ordinance if something like that happens. You know, maybe there's, you know, another another avenue of recovery that can be supported. But otherwise, you know, whatever's more local, whatever's, you know, cheapest and whatever gives us the best response is what we got to go with. All right. Mr. Cunningham. A tragic, horrific occurrence should never happen again. One of the things I would do would be putting the uh, officer into a, a training for that program just to make sure that they're up to speed. Um, I do not want to get rid of animal control in the town of Plainfield. We've been through that, like Vicky said, many times. We go through that iteration again and again with people thinking we're going to save money. Saving money is okay, but the bottom line is knowing the situation. NECOG is already full. They've been overflowing. How can you go to the NECOG unless they're then going to do one thing, buy back our facility and use it, and then the cost is going to go up again because they're going to add that cost onto their, their programming. So the whole thing is secular. I would not want to go out of, uh, of town. I want to keep it within town for everything that was mentioned so far. You are able to service everything from an emu yep. <laughs> to a horse to yep. cattle to dogs to anything that's going on. That animal control officer comes out and takes care of business. And if they're not, they have to follow through like a chain of command. They go through. They, they're governed by the police. Mm -hmm. So that's the process. Um, I do not advocate for it when it came up in the budget this past uh, previous year I was totally against it I did not want to go out and I thought that that was just a, a a shortcut to try to save some money but it also lost us would have lost us a lot of service because service time waiting for NECOG right now if you ask the other towns huh, it could be days unfortunately um, so I don't want that I want our own service to be able to handle within hours all right, thank you, Ms. Meyer. Anything to add for a minute? Uh, well, you know what? It, I think it would be a good idea to review a plan that NECOG would want to put into place before we absolutely say no to NECOG. But I agree. I mean, I myself had coyote, a coyote attack my chickens. Now, that's not something that I want to deal with. And animal control came out very quickly and handled it for me. So I think we shouldn't take anything off the table, but I do support what I know now, which is nothing about NECOG's plan, um, would be to support the animal control in town. All right, Ms. Tendrich, anything to add? No, I just think that we are all in agreement with that. And the other thing I'd just like to say, it, it really is the responsibility of the owners of the dogs. You have to, you have to really be a responsible pet owner. Thank you, Mr. Real. You know, in, in going to that responsibility, I mean, if something like that happens, I mean, if you are that reckless where you, you own a pet, you don't take care of a pet and it develops those traits, you know, then, yeah, I mean, we, we should support, you know, whoever was injured and, and if they want to, like, lean that other person's property. I mean, that that's just, but otherwise, as far as, like, you know, animal control goes, I mean, if it's not broke, you know, don't fix it. Right. Thank you. Mr. Cunningham, one minute if you so choose. Uh, very quickly. Um, well, I, I was talking about training before for the uh, training really to me would be for the animal control officer to make sure the situation is handled properly in the future, but also training for the, for the um, owners of the animals. We don't seem to have a, have a lot of that where you're talking about um, care and maintenance for your animal, liability issues for your animals, and what the liability be, would be to you. So I think those types of things could be talked about in the future where we have those sessions to help residents so they understand what the issues are. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the next question. And Ms. Meyer again. Um, numer here's the question. Numerous complaints have been coming in recent years of people dumping waste around town, both in wooded areas as well as next to clothing donation bins. There have also been many complaints about limited hours and opportunities available 
to Plainfield residents for disposing of waste. Do you think Plainfield makes it easy enough for residents to dispose of bulky waste and other forms of garbage? And do you have any strategies for reducing the amount of litter and illegal dumping, dumping rather, throughout the town? Two minutes. Thank you. I know there's been a lot of complaints about dumping, and uh, we're big hikers in our family, and I'm in the state forest all the time, and we do report garbage dumping in the state forest. As far as uh, Willimantic Waste running our trash, dis um, uh, um, trash removal, that's, we pay for that privately. Um, you can hire whatever hauler you want. Um, that is an expense that I do believe should stay with the residents because municipal trash hauling is extremely expensive. It's sad that we had to reduce our, our uh, accessibility to utilize the, the transfer station to only Saturdays. Um, that I think we should have been able to keep open on Wednesdays as well. We went from 18 trips a year to four, and only now on one day. I think that's a contract that needs to be looked at again. Um, I do not like to see trash on the side of the road, and I know our local um, highway department has done a lot to keep that as clean as possible. I applaud their um, work. We really, I think we do need to look at that contract again and make sure that Plainfield residents do have enough uh, ability to get to some place to dispose of their trash. But private trash hauling is, I, I do believe, is still the way to go in Plainfield because it is in, outrageously expensive to make that a municipal project. Thank you. Ms. Tendrich, two minutes, please. First, I'd like to comment on the clothing boxes. I feel as a business, if you agree to have one of those boxes put on your property, then the responsibility should fall back on that business. So if you have a box on your property and you see that people are dumping outside of it, then either number one, you need to remove the stuff that's outside of that box, or you need to not have the box asked to have it removed. So I feel like that should fall back on the business owner, not the town. As far as the town dump, we really do need to explore that contract. We did go from 18 visits to four visits and the days were cut down. But my understanding is when that contract was put together, it was used, it was based on 6,000 families. A little over 2,000 families have permits for that dump. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand when the contract was renegotiated why the visits were cut down because if it was originally contracted for 6,000 families and only a little over 2,000 used it, I think that maybe, yes, maybe 18 visits is a little bit too much but we still had plenty of room to have days for people to use the dump. And if it was contracted for 6,000 families and only 2,100 was used, that the days really should not have been cut down. So I do believe that that contract needs to be explored and maybe renegotiated. Thank you. Mr. Real. I think this goes to uh, one, of, one of the classic recurring issues in Plainfield of blight. And everyone likes to go out and say, you know, we ought to have like a blight enforcement officer. And that's just going to be another position that we can't afford. However, I did come up with something that, you know, would be fair and would help address this. Because a lot of people dump and, and a lot of the property owners, quite frankly, they just put up with it. And a lot of these issues do result in things that damage property value and involve hazardous waste. So my proposal would be this. You know, if you're a property owner and you're going to put up with it, you know, then we'll send you a letter saying um, clean it up. And if you don't clean it up, we will go ahead and we will notify the, you know, mortgage holder if you have one. And the insurance company will come out and they'll clean it up and then they can foreclose you. Otherwise, the other enhancement to that would be like, you clean up your property or forget it. You don't get to record anything on the land records. You don't get to refinance. You know, so that would motivate, you know, everybody from like, you know, your average property owner to like say, you know, even if Bank of America owned a parcel that they didn't clean up. I mean, because I know they had uh, a property in Moosip that they let go, you know, I mean, not too long ago. So, I mean, it's a fair solution. It doesn't involve another you know, government worker coming out. And at the same time, we actually got the town cleaned up. Right. Thank you. Mr. Cunningham, two minutes, please. Your question really evolved, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it was a big question to start with, but it, it did evolve. It started off with the um, dumping of waste, 
and we talked about the, uh, the the clothing boxes, which I think they did a good job of putting an ordinance out there to, to make it so that you're, if you own one, if you have one on your property, you're responsible. That's number one. Next thing would be um, definition of, of, of uh, a dump, because it's really called a transfer station because it is for transfer items that go to Willimantic Waste. Um, and then the third thing would have been really what you take in your home, at, at your home for like a, a Willimantic Waste for, for normal household stuff. Um, the transfer station, though, is something I wanted to address really quickly. I think that we should be doing like we did with the pool, like we did with the daycare. I think we should make it so that it is not even on our tax rolls anymore. My proposal would be to go back to what we were doing before at the highway garage to put in a scale system, and therefore the only people that use it are the ones who are paying for it by the pound. Because take a look around you. Every other town around us has the same system. And they... They ratio out their money based on the last 10 years' worth of uh, volume that are being used, and then they were able to calculate what the rate is. You're, you're going to take that off your tax rolls totally, and therefore the only people that use it are the only people that are going to pay for it, and at that point you're done. You, you and included a, a, a uh, cost for workers and a maintenance cost and the first-time fee for the purchase and install, installation of the, of the scale. After that... It's one less thing you have on your tax rolls to worry about. Right. Ms. Meyer, anything to add for a minute? Yes. I mean, we got ourselves in a huge problem 10, 20 years ago when we were running our own garbage or transfer station dump, whatever you want to call it. I don't think the town should be responsible. I don't know if that's what Mr. Cunningham was talking about. Um, I don't think we should be in the garbage business at all. Um, but I do think that there is a way that we can... Um, look at how it is paid for, um, but I really don't think the town should take over garbage collection. Uh, also, if you see someone dumping uh, garbage or whatever, I think really we have an extremely professional and responsive police department in Plainfield. Call them. They will come out. They will take your statement. They will investigate. We have to make people know that this is something that's not, a, a, that's not acceptable in Plainfield, and there will be consequences for it. Thank you. Ms. Tendrich, one minute. My first concern about the town taking over the dump or the, the transfer station is cost-wise. How are you going to, going to budget in how many people use it besides the weight? Who's going to haul that out of there? And then who's going to monitor that? Who's going to be at that gate to watch? So, again, that's going to put a, a tax burden on the townspeople. And the other thing with that is... What concerns me is if only a certain amount of people can afford, and I know, Mr. Cunningham, when you were in office, there was a charge for a dump pass. For the people that cannot afford that, I think if we're concerned about garbage and um, mess being dumped where it shouldn't be, I think that's going to create people to do that even more. All right. Thank you. Mr. Real. I, I have nothing to add. Thank you. Mr. Cunningham. <laughs> Okay, just to, just to go back, um, if you're figuring out the cost of what it's going to cost to run the whole program and you've figured in the cost of the employees to work on the Wednesdays and the, and the Saturdays like we used to, and you've figured out what the, the maintenance cost is going to be, and you know how much it's going to cost bulk-wise to go to back to transfer, uh, transfer it back over to Willimantic Waste, your numbers are already there. So there's no added cost. It's figured in already for per pound. The other thing is, let's, let's talk about what was mentioned before. You have... People have been dumping for years all over the town. It's, it's not going to stop. There's no way to stop people. Remember the old uh, Plainfield Pride Day? <laughs> that was something that people were from coming from out of towns all over the place, coming in and dumping stuff after we had already cleaned it up. So it's never going to stop. But I want to have two free passes a year for those people who can't afford so that they can come in and utilize it. Uh, after that, we should be all, all right. Thank you. Uh, we're going to keep going because I've only got one final question from our news department, so we might as well uh, forge ahead and, and get this done. And here it is. Uh, in an interview with WINY, outgoing first selectman Paul Sweet said that his biggest disappointment in all the years he served as chief elected official is that he never succeeded in his goal to build a town-owned library. While Plainfield residents do fund and utilize the services of the privately owned Aldridge Free Public Library, do you share in any vision for bringing a publicly owned library to the town of Plainfield? Why or why not, and could Plainfield afford it? Two minutes. 
Thank you. Another hot topic in Plainfield. <laughs> I'm a big fan of the library. I mean, I, my degree is in history and social science, so I've spent a lot of time in the library back in the day before we all had the Internet, right? Um, I think that a, a library is essential to a town. It's a great resource. It's family-friendly. Um, I think one of the things that we struggled with in Plainfield is having these, all, these little individual libraries. And they were all sort of providing the same services, and we were paying for four, four of them. If we could, cons and now we we just have the Aldrich Library, which is delightful. It's small and it's it's kind of outdated at this point. If we could afford to find to get grants or support from the state um, to build a library, a central library in Plainfield, I think that would be amazing. It's, it would be a safe place for, for children and adults to go. It would be a place where they could access uh, internet if they don't have it at home to do their homework. Uh, we wouldn't be purchasing four of the same books so that they would be in each individual library. It would be a real asset to the town. It's been a, it's been a hot potato of a uh, subject for quite a while, but I do believe it would be wonderful because we have very little to do in Plainfield, as we have all stated, and having a central library, a state-of-the-art library, would be amazing. Thank you. Ms. Tendridge, two minutes, please. I agree with Vicki. It is a very hot topic in Plainfield and it's a hot topic for the people at Aldrich Library. Mm -hmm. It's historic, <laughs> let's put it that way, the library in Moosup. But again, I feel to bring us into the next generation and to help the kids in our town, I think it would be beneficial. But again, with the state budget the way it is, just like Vicki had stated, we need to find grant money, we need to find funding to be able to do that. But not only will it help the younger generation, it's going to help even the, the senior citizens in our area and even, even the middle-aged. Um, it's a place that you can go, you can do your homework, you can study. Again, you have Wi-Fi, you have internet, and a lot of families cannot afford to have that in their home. So I just think it would be beneficial and it would really help the residents in Plainfield. Thank you. Mr. Real. I, I'd given uh, this some thought, and I, I came up with, um, I, I don't believe this has been put out before, but, you know, the idea of combining the existing library we have with the high school, I mean, at first when the high school was built, when it was new, I, I looked at this and I'm like, my God, this is the Taj Mahal to end Taj Mahals. It's, it, it's, it's, it's a lot more high school than we really needed. You know, but at the end of the day, it's already here. It's already built. There's plenty of space. You know, so why not combine the library with the high school? That way you have, like, you know, the librarians there, they're working with kids. And, you know, we could also do initiatives where, I mean, let's face it, books are free. I mean, a lot of people are giving books away. There's no reason we can't, you know, just go out and start using that space to start collecting, you know, more book inventory. So if we do it this way, I think we get an excellent confluence where kids get help studying and at the same time, you know, they could come into some pretty interesting books. And believe it or not, there's a lot of resources out there just for practical example. You could, you know, go to law firms. They have old outdated practice guides. I mean, maybe that's just one far off example. It's a little, you know, unusual. But, I mean, people are always looking to unload knowledge, you know. And we could, we could really take uh, an unfortunate budget situation and turn it into an amazing opportunity. Right, thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Okay, um, I'm all for a new library. We talked about this maybe, I don't know, six, seven years ago, there was a town meeting on it and they talked about going over to the old um, bank. And I think there was a Jewish City Savings Bank when they were about to move and build a new one. Um, there was discussion at that time about doing it and it finally just fell to the wayside. But at that same time, the library committee that had been going for years of the combined libraries we're still talking about having a, a centralized library. They had a person who was donating land if it was to be used as a library only. Um, I think it was right beside the Victorian, that piece of land right there. That piece of land could have been a library. They already had raised enough money in grants, one-time grant money, to purchase and build probably about two-thirds of that library. We would have had to come up with some other ways to fundraise and, and gain the rest of the money to build it. The only downside to something like that would be is the cost to run and maintain it after that because obviously it's going to be a little more money because it's a brand-new building. It will be, be bigger. But to have that library uh, for recreation and education, 
I would suggest that they did that by adding in a couple of conference rooms because you can then rent out the conference rooms, help to pay for it, um, to offset the cost for it. I think that would be a fantastic idea. It is something, again, you need to be putting into your, your, your town because if a business says, okay, is your educational system great? What do you have for recreation? Uh, uh, oh, you have a little library called Aldridge? It's one, of the th it's one of the little things that they look at as their workforce, as they say, is something else they can enhance to say, this is what I, we offer you if you're going to come and work for us. This is what the area looks like and what we can do. So I think it's something that it should be done, not later, sooner. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Meyer, anything to add? Yes. Um, I would just like to say that I completely disagree with Mr. Real. Um, the library and the high school is located in the center of the building. And there are issues at the high school um, that should not be, um, should not mix with young children. I mean, we have a lot of young kids that utilize libraries, story time, all those other things. And bringing young children into a high school setting, I think, is inappropriate. Um, there's no way to, for them to get to the, high, to the high school library without going into the high school itself. So I think that should be a separate issue. All right. Thank you. Ms. Tendridge, anything to add? I do. I agree a little bit with Vicki, but the first thing that entered my mind when Mr. Real stated that was disrupting the school day. So if you have people that want to visit the library during the day, I think it would be a disturbance to the the students who are using the library and not only that then it opens up the school you have to keep it unlocked all the time and that could become a security and I'm not saying people go into the library that you have to worry about that but it's just opening it up again and having more people in and out of the school system thank you mr. real well I, I do want to say this as far as um, and I, I think part of what you said was certainly a a valid and appropriate indictment of the condition of our schools and I wish we had more opportunity to discuss this because frankly uh, anything you know we would spend fourteen thousand dollars you know per pupil per year on I would want to be very very incredibly satisfied with that product and quite frankly it is it is it is so sorely lacking a lot of that is state mandates you know but the bottom line is we we should have an educational system where we shouldn't feel i mean that apprehension of having you know children like you know of different age groups like mingling and learning together i mean you know i mean that, that that's that's disturbing that we don't we don't feel safe and i would agree to an extent maybe that's true but we should we should really you know, take a hard look at our schools. Thank you, Mr. Cunningham. Uh, just two points. One would be um, the logistics. Having it in the high school, the logistics would not work. And and you're looking at, you still have after school programs at the high school. So even if you're trying to make it so that the library is open after school, uh, the high school hours, you're still looking at a logistic issue. Um, the mingling of, of uh, uh, after school classes or, or sports, and then the younger kids coming in with family, it just wouldn't work. Um, that is one thing. The other thing is the Aldridge Library, by the way, is a, a property that's deeded for and only for a library. Could they continue? Absolutely. If they got donations, they can continue as a, a small neighborhood library, which w works fantastic over in that area. But um, unfortunately, that is deeded just for that, so we couldn't you know, modify and change it to anything else. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's take a breather, and then we'll, uh, we'll talk about wrapping this up. I'll be right back. Hello, this